Hello everyone, Sergeant Ergy right here, and today we're going to be reacting to Napoleon's Marshals Part 2. But yeah, um, this was requested in the comments section like a bunch of times, and yeah, uh, one of you insisted I react to it, like, um, ASAP, so yeah, why not, you know? And also, I want to take a bit of a break from the Hannibal series, because that is like 12 episodes long. It's it's very it's very long. I'm just going to be taking a bit of a break. Uh, this video is actually 31 minutes long. So, this video might be pretty long, actually. But I'll try to keep it short. I'll try to keep my reaction short. Also, again, I'll be reacting to that tank video after this video, I believe. And then, you know, we'll, we'll just see where it goes. I'll keep reacting to the Hannibal video, probably. Also, again, I'm using a different recording software, because the other one decided to be stupid a bunch of different times. And, again, I, I need to get to 195 subscribers, and then I will be doing the live stream of the 2020 presidential election. It'll be very nice. I'll be doing Q&As, I'll be talking about my channel. Etc. Yeah, we're at 186 right now. We're only nine to go, actually. Getting there pretty quickly. But, anyway. Oh gosh, my cat is very upset. I don't know why. Anyways, yeah. Just make sure to subscribe so we can get that live stream. One more thing. I know I keep making announcements and this intro is already long. But, I tried to make this video twice already. Twice. And the recording software failed. That was back when I was using the other recording software. And it failed twice. So, yeah. That's one of the reasons why I'm using a different recording software. Without further ado, let's get started. Napoleon's and Marshalls, part two. Terror belly, Terror in war. Ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. Oh yeah, this is the same intro that I had earlier when he was talking about the baton. In France, the title of marshal, Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. Wow. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. What? That's dumb. I think it, I'm pretty sure it said all this earlier, though. And plus, I've already, I've already reacted to most of this video. So, I'm pretty unfortunate. But in 1804, yes. Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. Wow, so it was gone for like five to ten years. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. Oh my god, what are you doing? All 26 close? have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Port. Former chief historian of the French army. Ooh, that's nice. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brun, oh, yeah, like Kellerman, Grouchy, Monse, Bonyatovsky, and Jordan. Jordan. Before we begin, a big yeah, thing. thank you. Okay, what just happened? Oh, uh... Yeah. We shared some favorites on the themes of military Ulster's DC Comics. Or to find art that reflects your passions and personality. What's more, Displate is an environmentally conscious company which recently passed a milestone of helping to plant 10 million trees. Until the 10th of October, you buy about one. the trees. Trees and family. 18. Marshal Bernadotte. 
Oh, Bernadotte, they talked about that dude a lot back in the old series. I can't believe it was already two months ago. It feels like I've been I reacted to that series yesterday. I can only say that Bernadotte let me down. I can accuse some of ingratitude, but not of treason. Napoleon. Bernadotte enlisted in the French Royal Army, aged 17, and proved, yeah, he lived to be old. proved a model soldier, rising to become the senior non-commissioned officer in his regiment in just 10 years. The French Revolution and active service this opened the door to rapid promotion. He was made an officer, and thanks to exemplary leadership and courage, rose in rank from captain to general of division in a single year. What? How do you do that? How do you get promoted that fast? Look at this timeline. Yeah, how do you can... How do you get promoted four times consecutively and in the same... Like, a few months, that's crazy. In, like, the same eight months? Wow. Very interesting consecutive figures there. Not even Napoleon rose through the ranks as quickly. Jeez. He particularly distinguished himself at Fleurus, leading an attack that helped secure Jourdan's famous victory. So why is he, like, in the middle? As a professional soldier and ex-Sergeant Major, Bernadotte insisted on the highest standards of discipline and conduct from his men. That's good. He even fought a duel with his own chief of staff, whom he accused of taking a bribe. In 1797, Bernadotte Wait, well, did he? was transferred to Italy, where he served under Napoleon's command for the first time. By this stage, both men had brilliant reputations, but despite a good first meeting, a clash of styles and jealous rivalry soon emerged between them. Oh, What's gosh. more, Bernadotte had immediately got on the wrong side of the future Marshal Berthier, Napoleon's chief. chief of staff, by arresting one of his friends for insubordination. Where's the... Hold on. Insubordination definition. Defiance of authority. Okay. Okay. Well. Wow. In 1798, Bernadotte married Napoleon's ex-fiancée, Desiree Clary. What? Her sister Julie was married to Napoleon's brother, Joseph, meaning Bernadotte was now family. But when Napoleon asked Bernadotte Whoa, Napoleon looks so weird in that photo. His coup of 18 Brumaire, he refused, though he did not actively oppose it. Oh. Napoleon suspected Bernadotte of conspiring against him, but the Clary sisters helped to keep the peace. Throughout this period, Bernadotte held key posts. As Minister of War in 1799, Commander of the Army of the West in 1800, and Governor of Hanover in 1804, proving highly effective oh, yeah. in each role. That's that nice. year, Napoleon made Bernadotte a marshal, and he commanded First Corps. Yeah, like, no wonder. Look at all of his achievements. Seriously. At the Battle of Austerlitz, playing a relatively minor part in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was rewarded with the title Prince of Ponte Corvo. But his relationship with Napoleon remained difficult. In 1806, as Napoleon took on Prussia, oh, yeah, Bernadotte was blamed for failing to... Yeah, make sure to check out that episode. I made an episode about that. Also, another thing, this... Oh no, what happened to my thing? Anyways. Um, this episode actually came out. Fifteen days ago. ...to support Marshal Davout at the Battle of Harstead, and was nearly called Marshal. Though Bernadotte Jeez. partly redeemed himself with a vigorous pursuit of the beaten Prussians. That's nice. Good job, Bernadotte. The next year, he missed the Battle of Eylau, after his orders were intercepted by the Russians. 
and a gunshot wound to the neck meant he also missed the Battle of Friedland. Oh yeah, I made a video about the Battle of Friedland too. Make sure to check that out. Command of First Corps passing to General Victor. When war resumed with Austria in 1809, Bernadotte was given command of the 9th Saxon Corps. On the evening of the first yeah, day of the gigantic so. Battle of Wagram, his troops were in heavy fighting with the Austrians. But dressed in white, like the Austrians, they came under devastating friendly fire, panicked. Oh my gosh, why is the door being closed so many times? Anyways. And routed. The next morning, Bernadotte pulled... They're all wearing the same. Why, though? Why? They're all gonna fight you. That's just terrible. That's just a blunder right there. Seriously. His men back without orders, and when they later retreated again, he and the Emperor exchanged sharp words on the battlefield. Oh, gosh. Bernadotte then issued a proclamation to the Saxons praising their conduct and outraging Napoleon. Whoa, I didn't know he spoke English. He sent an English letter to a German country. That's weird. Even though he's French. Okay, but all kidding aside. What the heck, dude? That's not cool. Bernadotte was sent in semi-disgrace to the Dutch coast to oversee the defeat of a major British landing at Valkenburg. Good. But another triumphant proclamation, effectively publicizing the strength of his forces, further infuriated Napoleon. <laughs> in an unlikely twist of fate, in 1810, Swedish politicians invited Bernadotte to become Crown Prince of Sweden. The current king was old and childless, and Bernadotte was a proven general and administrator, member of the French imperial family, and well regarded by Swedish army officers, who remembered his fair treatment of Swedish prisoners three years earlier in Pomerania. What? What the heck? That is, that literally makes me <laughs> Why? Why would they just get some random French general who's fighting in the middle of a war to be the king of Sweden? That does not... What? Like... That would be like in World War II. Like, Sweden asks... Or like, Switzerland or something asks... Hey... Uh, no, never mind. Switzerland is a democracy. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is in the government, but, but, just, but just, just pretend they're monarchies, just for the sake of simplicity. That would be like Switzerland in World War II going like, hey, hey, Mr. Irvin Rommel from North Africa, uh, do you want to be, do you want to be the leader of Switzerland for the rest of your life? Like, that just doesn't make, what? That does not make any sense. <laughs> it's just, just hilarious. And also, as we know, Sweden did declare war on Napoleon, on France. So what the heck, dude? He literally just betrayed them. So I'm, I'm surprised why Napoleon didn't say it was treason, because that seems a lot like treason. Napoleon was at first bemused, remarking that he could think of other marshals who were better qualified, but he did give his assent. Even when Bernadotte made it clear that as Crown Prince, he would pursue Swedish interests. He was true to his word. Three years later, with Napoleon on the ropes after his disastrous invasion of Russia, Crown Prince Bernadotte brought Sweden into the Sixth Coalition. Look at that horse's face. Wow, look at that. That looks cool. That just, that image. And declared war on France. With his insider knowledge, he helped the Allies to devise the Trachenberg Plan, a strategy for defeating Napoleon in Germany by avoiding battle with Napoleon himself 
and targeting only his marshals. Oh, yeah. In September, Bernadotte defeated former comrades Marshals Udino and Ney at Denevitz. Five weeks later, he played a major role in the great Allied victory at Leipzig. Bernadotte's legacy would prove the most lasting of any of Napoleon's marshals. The royal house of Bernadotte sits on the Swedish throne to this day. What? So the king of Sweden right now is part French. That's so weird. This is so weird. Like, what the heck? Bernadotte was labeled a traitor by Napoleon's supporters, though not by Napoleon himself. He was unquestionably a gifted soldier and administrator. But his personality clash and long-running feud with the Emperor meant he was never a great marshal. Marshal Agarau. 17. Marshal Ogerou. Oh, Ogerou. Watch this video twice already and I still don't remember how to pronounce the name. His courage, his outstanding virtues elevated him far above the crowd. But honors, title, and money plunged him back into it. Ogerou had, by his own account, an eventful younger life, serving at various times with the French, Russian, and Prussian armies, deserting or being kicked out of all three in dubious circumstances. Dang. He briefly earned a living in Dresden as a fencing master, with a feared reputation as a duelist. He embraced the French Revolution and joined a volunteer cavalry regiment known as the German Legion, before holding German various Legion. staff and training roles Oh yeah, well I guess it's true. France did control so German ethnic li Sorry guys, I'm gonna call with my friend. Michael, what are you do doing? Oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna call with the famous YouTuber called XXogami underscore shusoi XX, the famous YouTuber. Telling me not to tell you my your channel. I think he's embarrassed. But yeah, I already have it like on in my channel, like homepage. It shows his channel. But yeah, go subscribe to him and watch his videos. Um. Yeah. Uh, okay. He just told me he's deleting all of his videos. Oh, he's probably kidding. Michael, don't. I mean, Og Ogami Shusoi, don't delete your videos. Come on, man. No, don't do it. Come on, man. You like to... Anyways, he has more subscribers than me. He had more views. But... Anyways. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Um, France had a large piece of ethnically German land at the time, for those of y'all who don't know. They controlled, like, the Rhineland, that whole region. Um, the region, like, the from the west of the Rhine River. And a lot of that land, you know, at a certain point, was German. And, I mean, it still is today. And then, of course, the state of Alsace, and a small slither of Lorraine, and, of course, Luxembourg, I guess you could argue. It's German, part of Belgium. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Where is it? So yeah, I'm wondering if this guy is German, but he doesn't seem to have a German name. Why is he part of the German cavalry? Or German legion, whatever. Experience in the regular Prussian army proved valuable. Promoted to general, Augereau served in the... Oh, not yet! They didn't control... Look at that! ...offered training roles where his experience in the regular Prussian army proved valuable. They didn't promote... They didn't control it yet. But they did control, still, Alsace, and a slither of Lorraine, so they still technically had some German land. To the general, Augereau served in the Eastern Pyrenees, where his flair for tactics and bold, decisive action helped win a series of victories over the Spanish. 
Later serving in Italy under Napoleon, Augereau proved a highly effective divisional commander. The future emperor's reports were glowing. Strong character, firmness, energy, has the habit of war, liked by his men, and lucky. That's good. Those are all in 1796, good Augereau played a leading role in Napoleon's victories over the Austrians at Castiglione and Arcole. In fact, the painting of Augereau's heroism at Arcole Bridge long predates the more famous version by Verne, in which Napoleon takes the center stage. Well, that's sad. It's my figure of generals. Yeah, wow. That looks cool. What is that? What is that dude doing? He's like on the left. What is that little kid doing? And is an even greater work of fiction. Augereau's standing among fellow generals, however, was damaged by an enthusiasm for looting to rival General Brune. While rude. others were irritated. Rude. Come on, man. That's rude. Don't, don't loot. By his loud and boastful manner. Augereau was oh. known to be a reliable Republican. And in 1797, Napoleon sent him to Paris to be the military muscle for the coup of 1854. This was an army-backed purge of pro-royalist politicians threatening to restore the French monarchy. Oh, wow. A brief spell in charge of the Army of the Rhine demonstrated that Augereau was not suited for high command, as his unruly entourage and obsession with plunder caused chaos at headquarters. Oh, God. As a Republican, Augereau initially opposed Napoleon's seizure of political power, but soon sensed which way the wind was blowing and pledged support. Created a marshal in 1804, status, wealth, and declining health served to mellow Augereau's behavior. He commanded 7th Corps in the 1805 campaign, but was held in reserve and missed the great battles of Ulm and Austerlitz. The following year, he was in the thick of the fighting at Jena, leading 7th Corps against the Prussian southern flank. At Hela, in 1807, Augereau oh, yeah. was so ill he had to be that, strapped too. to his horse. You can get a video on Hela, I'll just go ahead and check it out. That should be in the description. But led 7th Corps into battle in terrible winter conditions. Oh! Ordered to advance, his corps lost its way in a blizzard, was mown down by Russian guns, charged... Yeah, I actually have all my previous Napoleon reaction videos in the comments. So yeah, go ahead and check those out. Starting from part one all the way to Napoleon's Marshals part one. Actually destroyed. Jeez. Bosro himself was hit and crushed under his own horse. Oh no. He returned to France to recover. Oh he's still but was never the same again. His yeah. energy and zeal were gone. No during Napoleon's war in Spain was sent to replace Saint-Cyr as commander That's of the sad. army of Catalonia. He completed the grim seven-month siege of Girona. Jeez, he's sitting in with his gun. That's, that's cool. Replaced by MacDonald for his lackluster performance. In 1812, Augereau commanded depots and reinforcements in the rear as the Grande d'Armée marched to its destruction in Russia. Oh, no. However, at Leipzig, he was briefly back to his best, inspiring his small corps of conscripts to fight for several key villages in the south in the face of relentless Austrian attack. Oh, yes. oh yeah, Leipzig, I also did a video on that. In 1814, Napoleon gave Augereau command of the Army of the Rhone. Good job. But he surrendered Lyon without a fight. And on news of Napoleon's abdication, denounced his former emperor as a man who, having sacrificed millions of victims to his cruel ambitions, has not known how to die like a soldier. Whoa. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Augereau Whoa. proclaimed his loyalty once more. But... Dude! Oh my gosh, this guy is... I don't like him. The Emperor was not interested. Augereau was stripped of his baton and died the next year. Mm. 16. 
Marshall, Marshall Lefebvre. Lefebvre. <laughs> How do you read that? Lefebvre. Oh my gosh. Hold on. What an interesting name. 60. Marshall Lefebvre. 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 Okay. A truly brave man who does not concern himself with the maneuvers of his left and right, but thinks only of fighting well. Is not, wait, hold on. He's not afraid to die. Napoleon. Francois Lefebvre was a sergeant with 16 years' service in the elite Garde Française when the French Revolution broke out. When the Guard was disbanded, he became an officer in the Paris National Guard and received the first of many wounds protecting the royal family from an angry mob. Oh, wow. Every inch the soldier, the Revolutionary Wars brought Lefebvre opportunity for active command and rapid promotion. In just two years, he rose from captain to general, establishing a reputation as a formidable divisional commander, a good tactician, brave, energetic, and attentive to the needs of his men. And once you think you would be a lot higher than he is now? Well, I've said that a lot already. Like, one, I mean, not a lot, one time. But, like, still, all those things you would think you would be higher. His chief of staff, the future Marshal Soult, acknowledged that he learned much from Lefebvre's example. In 1799, Lefebvre commanded the Paris military district. Not much impressed by politicians. When Napoleon asked him to support a coup, he was all for it, declaring, oh yes, let's throw the lawyers into the river. In 1804, Jeez. Napoleon made Lefebvre an honorary marshal. Wow, it looks honorary. like he's wearing a blanket. Because Napoleon assumed Lefebvre would prefer a quiet life in the Senate after a decade's active service with the scars to prove it. But he'd underestimated Lefebvre for a frontline role. So the Emperor gave him command of the Imperial Guard Infantry for the Jena campaign. The next year, Lefebvre commanded the Siege of Danzig inspiring the troops of 10th Corps by leading one counterattack in person. After the successful conclusion of the siege, Napoleon awarded Lefebvre the title Duke of Danzig. Ooh. Lefebvre's record as a corps commander was mixed. In Spain, he exasperated Napoleon by twice ignoring orders. What? But in 1809, when Ignored Archduke orders. Charles of Austria launched a sudden attack on Bavaria, Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps was crucial in slowing the enemy advance oh, nice. until Napoleon arrived to take charge. He was then given the difficult task of suppressing a popular revolt in the Tyrol, led by Andreas Hofer, which he achieved despite some early setbacks. For the invasion of Russia... Yeah, what is gonna do that puts him so low. Lefebvre commanded the infantry of the old Not solo, more like, you know, sort of in the middle. Old guard. During the retreat from Moscow, the 57-year-old marshal insisted on marching on foot at the head of the guard all the way. Wow. At the end of the retreat, he was devastated to learn that his son, a 27-year-old general, was among nearly a hundred thousand men who had not survived the march. Oh, no. He had That's been Lefebvre's so last surviving child of 14. Jeez. After a year God. recovering from exhaustion and grief, Lefebvre returned to lead the old guard one last time in the defense of France oh, and was in heavy fighting at Montmirail and Montereau. But in April 1814, he was one of the marshals who confronted Napoleon with the reality of his position and forced him to abdicate. Lefebvre and his wife, an ex-washerwoman turned duchess, were famous for their lack of airs and graces, for honest, blunt speech, and for always helping out old comrades. When a friend commented on Lefebvre's wealth and titles, the marshal invited him into the courtyard I'll have ten shots at you with a musket at thirty paces, he told him. If I miss, the whole estate is yours. Well, when the friend declined, Lefebvre added, 
I had a thousand bullets fired at me from closer before I got all of this. What? The Fevre was too exhausted Ooh. to take an active role in the Waterloo campaign. The so he accepted a role as a senator under Napoleon, which led to a brief period in disgrace when the Bourbons returned. His rank and honours were restored to him a year before his death in 1820. Wow, he killed two, he died 200 years ago. That's pretty young. A year before his death in 1820. Marshal Mortier. Marshal Mortier. Mortier. The three best of my generals were Duval, Sao, and Bessier. Mortier was the most feeble. Sorry, my friend Jackson is really bad. Edouard Mortier was from a prosperous middle class background in northern France. When the French Revolution began in 1789, he volunteered for the National Guard, a oh, new wow. middle-class militia charged with preserving order and defending against counter-revolution. When war broke out with France's neighbours, Mortier's unit was sent to the front. Standing six foot four, Mortier was conspicuous for his height and bravery. Yeah, and at the time, um, people were not as tall as they were now. Is like humans that over time they're actually getting taller, which is interesting. So the average height back then was way lower than it is now. So for someone to be six four, that's like someone being seven foot today, or something like that, or like six ten, whatever. Six eight, whatever. It's it's and the point is that's he's really he's like a giant at the time compared to ever the average person. Wounded twice and winning praise from his commander, the future Marshal Lefebvre. In 1799, Mortier fought under General Massena's command at the Second Battle of Zurich, oh, helping to defeat the Russians and winning promotion to the rank of General of Division. Mortier then spent three years commanding the Paris military district. His efficiency impressed the new First Consul, Napoleon Bonaparte who chose him for an important mission in 1803. The occupation of Hanover, a German state belonging to the Hanoverian kings of Britain, with whom France was, once more, at war. Mortier carried out this assignment with tact and diplomacy, ensuring the occupation was unopposed. Oh, nice. This delighted Napoleon, who rewarded him a year later with the rank of Marshal. Oh, wow. Following Napoleon's victory yes. over the Austrians at Ulm in 1805, Mortier and his new 8th Corps led the pursuit of the retreating Russians, but became encircled by a much larger force at Durenstein. Oh, Mortier yeah. fought his way out of the trap with a nighttime bayonet in charge, a remarkable escape, oh, wow. but his corps suffered heavy losses. Yeah, like he should have been encircled in the first place, that's horrible. Mortier and... He died at 36? Oh, wow. Oh, he became, became a marshal at 36. Okay, never mind. Eighth Corps were in a supporting role for the Jena campaign of 1806. But the next year at Friedland, his corps played an important role holding Napoleon's left wing, as the Emperor inflicted a devastating defeat on the Russians. Mm. Nice. Mortier was well liked by all and almost uniquely did not engage in feuds and rivalries with the other marshals. Houdinot was a particular friend. In East Prussia, their party trick was to snuff out the candles with pistol shots. What? They always That's paid generous cool. compensation for damage caused. Wow. In 1808, Mortier joined Napoleon for the invasion of Spain and commanded Fifth Corps at the brutal siege of Zaragoza. He then helped win a series of victories over Spanish forces, including the crushing victory at Ocaña, operating alongside another friend, Marshal Soult. Mortier was recalled to France to organize and train the Young Guard, a new junior unit of the Imperial Guard, made up of the best conscripts from each year's intake. 
Mortier led the Young Guard in Russia in 1812, but was powerless to prevent the Corps' destruction on that campaign. First through exhaustion and disease on the march to Moscow, then on the retreat, where his surviving troops were effectively sacrificed to hold open the road at Krasny and allow the army's escape. Mortier continued to command the Young Guard during Napoleon's campaigns in Germany and France, and was never far from the action. In Lutzen, he was trapped under his wounded horse, was in heavy fighting at Leipzig, and had his hat shot through outside Paris. In 1814, the final defence of the French capital fell to troops under Mortier and Marmont, with support from Marshal Monsey's National Guard. Mortier told his men, we have not enough troops to resist their large armies for long, but today, more than ever before, we are fighting for our honor. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, he wanted Mortier to resume his customary role at the head of the young guard. But a severe attack of sciatica prevented him joining the emperor at Waterloo. Napoleon never regarded Mortier as suitable for major independent command, but his loyalty and conduct were always beyond reproach. He went on to serve the restored monarchy as ambassador to Russia and briefly minister for war. In 1835, he was riding beside King Louis Philippe in a public parade when an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi barreled gun. What? The king received a minor wound. But Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. Oh no. 14. Marshal Marmont. Marshal Marmont. I think I remember hearing about him too. Look at his you, bro. I was betrayed by Marmont. Who am I could call my son, my child, my creation? <laughs> Jeez. Vanity was his undoing. Oh, that's just sad. Marmont, like Napoleon, was a trained artillery officer and met the future emperor for the first time at the Siege of Toulon, well, where yeah. Napoleon made his name. Uh, yeah, they no, I made, I have put on that too. formed a friendship, and when Napoleon was given command of the French army in Italy, he took Major Marmont with him as an aide-de-camp. Marmont distinguished himself at several of Napoleon's early victories in Italy and was commanding his own artillery regiment by the age of 23. Oh, look, there's a dog right there. <laughs> the, and the cannon barrel was pointed like right let's do it. As part of Napoleon's inner circle, Marmont accompanied... Oh yeah, this is in Egypt. Hold on, it says it right there. Napoleon's Egypt expedition. Wait a minute. Did they even have an episode on that? Because I was... I think that was, a, that was a pretty cool, that was a pretty important event. But yeah, I don't think they had an episode on that that we could react to. Accompanied him on his expedition to Egypt in 1798, fighting in the battles of Alexandria and the Pyramids. Naturally, he backed Napoleon's coup of 18 Boumer as Napoleon overthrew the Directory and made himself First Consul of France. Six months later, Napoleon led an army over the Alps into Italy. It was his artillery commander, General Marmont, who figured out how to get the cannon through the mountain passes using man-hauled sledges. At the ensuing Battle of Marengo, Marmont's skilled handling of the artillery helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Second Coalition. Two years later, Marmont was made Inspector General of Artillery working with Napoleon to implement reforms that improved. What is that dog doing in that picture? Firepower, mobility, and supply. Marmont was bitterly disappointed not to be among the first marshals created in 1804. But he was still only 29, and Napoleon assured him that time was on his side. He was further frustrated in 1805, when his corps was sent to guard the army's strategic southern flank and so missed the great victory at Austerlitz. Was a big the spoils of that war included Dalmatia, which Marmont was sent to govern in 1806. Oh, nice. Though he lived in extravagant luxury, 
His reforms and infrastructure projects were so effective that even the Emperor of Austria later admitted, it's a great pity that Marmont was not in Dalmatia two or three years longer. What? When war broke oh, out God. with Austria again in 1809, Marmont marched north with 11th Corps to join Napoleon near Vienna. Ooh. But at the great battle of Wagram, his troops remained in reserve, while the other corps were engaged in ferocious fighting. Mm. At last, an opportunity to prove himself came as Napoleon ordered him to pursue the retreating Austrians. Nice. But reckless over-enthusiasm nearly led to disaster at Znaim. A week later, Napoleon created three new marshals, MacDonald, Oudinot, and Marmont. Nice. MacDonald for France, it was said, Oudinot for the army, mm. Marmont for friendship. Wow. Napoleon then rather undermined the moment by telling Marmont, between ourselves, you've not yet done enough to justify my choice. Uh, I mean, it's true. But... His big chance came in 1811, when he was sent to Spain to replace Marshal Massena. But after a promising start and some bold maneuvering against the British on the Douro River, he stumbled into disaster at Salamanca. Of course. Marmont himself was an early casualty of the battle, badly wounded by a shell burst and carried from the field, mm -hmm. as Wellington routed his army. After convalescing in France, Marmont was back with the Grande Armée in 1813, as Napoleon battled to save his empire. He commanded 6th Corps throughout the campaign in Germany, fighting at Lützen, Bautzen, and Dresden. At Leipzig, he held the northern sector with skill and determination, making Blücher's Prussians pay a high price for the village of Mürker. Marmont played an important role in Napoleon's 1814 defense of France, shadowing Blücher's movements along the Marne River and guarding the road to Paris. But by now, he was showing signs of exhaustion and disillusion. Oh, At the Battle of Long, he allowed his corps to be... Okay, why is this guy higher than those other generals that seem to be good? Like Bernadotte, for example, who seemed to be a pretty nice general. And the one right before it, I forget their names. But, and also, I can't... Like, I remember how to spell them, but I can't necessarily pronounce them very well. You wouldn't even know what I'm talking about anyway. But seriously, like, why is he so high? Surprised. Look at that horse. It didn't like fall off. Oh gosh, hold on, my cat wants to go in. Okay, let's see. By the enemy, with heavy loss. Oh, Napoleon's stinging criticism may have been the moment that ended Marmont's loyalty. Okay. He was the senior marshal in Paris when Maybe the Am his loyalty. It's his fault for being a, a like a not very competent marshal. Allies attacked on the thirtieth of March. After a day's fighting and facing the inevitable defeat, he negotiated the city's surrender. What? Five days later, with Napoleon at Fontainebleau still blackmailed by one of his oh, oldest comrades. What did I do? Wait, no. His corps over to the Allied line still. Five days later, with Napoleon at Fontainebleau still planning to march on Paris, Marmol marched his corps over to the Allied lines and surrendered. What? Napoleon what? was shocked at this betrayal by one of his oldest comrades. He'd already... Look how upset he looks. Look how upset Napoleon looks in that photo, Jesus. He looks big mad. ...been persuaded that he must try to abdicate in favor of his three-year-old son. Now he accepted that he must abdicate without conditions. Yeah, what... Why is Mar Marmont, or whatever is... Yeah, Marmont ranked so... Freaking highly, he does not seem like he was that good, especially since he just outright betrayed Napoleon and like had two disasters. Whether Marmont acted to save lives 
out of self-interest or spite, or a combination of all three, remains the subject of heated debate. We do know that he was well rewarded by the restored Bourbon king, and never yeah. forgiven by Bonaparte loyalists. What happened whenever Napoleon came back from exile? As military commander of Paris in 1830, Marmont could not prevent the next revolution and had to flee France. Good. He spent the rest of his life in exile, becoming tutor while he was in Vienna to Napoleon's son, the Duke of Reichstadt. Mm -hmm. He was the last of Napoleon's marshals to die in Venice in 1852. Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marble. Thirteen down, thirteen to go. It only did- that was only five and a thirty-one minute long video? Join us for part three, when we'll- How many more parts are there gonna be? Oh gosh. Anyways, yeah, wow. Thank you for watching everyone, that was very interesting. And I'm very glad that the video recorder didn't fail this time. Jesus Christ, this video is 46 minutes long. Oh my god. Continue the count. But anyways, wow, okay. What happened to my book or whatever? I don't even hear him. Thank you all for watching and goodbye. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you did enter, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. Oh yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not, better than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know, or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching, and have a great day.